The advantage of this is that he is enabled to make use of Don Quixote as a mouthpiece for his own reflections, and so, without seeming to digress, allow himself the relief of digression when he requires. It is true the amount of individuality bestowed upon Don Quixote is not very great. There are some natural touches of character about him, such as his mixture of irascibility and placability, and his curious affection for Sancho together with his impatience of the squire's loquacity. As to Sancho, it is plain, from the concluding words of the preface to the first part, that he was a favorite with his creator even before he had been taken into favor by the public. An inferior genius, taking him in hand a second time, would very likely have tried to improve him by making him more comical, clever, amiable, or virtuous. But Servants was too true an artist to spoil his work in this way. Sancho, when he reappears, is the old Sancho with the old familiar features, but with a difference. They have been brought out more distinctly, but at the same time with a careful... He is a much more important and prominent figure in the second part than in the first. Indeed, it is his matchless mendacity about Dulcinea that to a great extent supplies the action. His development in this respect is as remarkable as in any other. In the first part he displays a great natural gift of lying. His lies are not of the highly imaginative sort that liars in fiction commonly indulge in. Like Falstaff's, they resemble the father that begets them. They are simple. But in the service of such a master as Don Quixote, he develops rapidly, as we see when he comes to palm off the three country wenches as Dulcinea and her ladies in waiting. It is worth noticing how, flushed by his success in this instance, he is tempted afterwards to try a flight beyond his powers in his account of the journey on Clavellino. In the second part, it is the spirit rather than the incidents of the chivalry romances that is the subject of the burlesque. Enchantments of the sort travestied in those of Dulcinea and the Trifoldi, and the cave of Montesinos play a leading part in the later and inferior romances, and another distinguishing feature in the romances of chivalry, love is either a mere animalism or a fantastic idolatry. Only a coarse-minded man would care to make merry with the former, but to one of Cervantes who more the latter was naturally an attractive subject for ridicule. Like everything else in these romances, it is a gross exaggeration of the real sentiment of chivalry, but its peculiar extravagance is probably due to the influence of those masters of hyperbole when a Trovador professed his readiness to obey his lady in all things, he made it incumbent upon the next comer, if he wished to avoid the imputation of tameness and commonplace. This is what Servants deals with in Don Quixote's passion for Dulcinea, and in no instance has he carried out the burlesque more happily. By keeping Dulcinea in the background, and making her a vague shadowy being of whose very existence we are left in doubt, he invests Don Quixote's worship of her virtues and charms with an additional ex one of the great merits of Don Quixote, and one of the qualities that have secured its acceptance by all classes of readers and made it the most cosmopolitan of books, is its simplicity. There are, of course, points obvious enough to a Spanish 17th century audience which do not immediately strike a reader nowadays, and servants often takes it for granted that an illusion will be for example, on many of his readers in Spain, and most of his readers out of it, the significance of his choice of a country for his hero is completely lost. It would be going too far to say that no one can thoroughly comprehend Don Quixote without having seen La Mancha, but undoubtedly even a glimpse of La Mancha will give an insight into the meaning of servants. Of all the regions of Spain it is the last that would suggest the idea of romance. Of all the dull central Plato of the peninsula, it is the dullest tract. There is something impressive about the grim solitudes of Estremadura, and if the plains of Leon and Old Castel are bald and dreary, they are studded with old cities renowned in history, but there is no redeeming feature in the Manchigan landscape. It has all the sameness of the desert without its dignity. The few towns and villages that break its monotony are mean and commonplace. To anyone who knew the country well, the mere style and title of Don Quixote of La Mancha gave the key to the author's meaning at once. La Mancha as the knight's country and scene of his chivalries is of a piece with the pastboard helmet, 
the farm labor on us back for a squire, knighthood conferred by a rascally venture. It is strange that this element of incongruity, underlying the whole humor and purpose of the book, should have been so little heeded by the majority of those who have undertaken to interpret Don Quixote. To be sure, the great majority of the artists who illustrated Don Quixote knew nothing whatever of Spain. To them a venta conveyed no idea but the abstract one of a roadside inn, and they could not therefore do full justice to the humor of Don Quixote's misconception in taking it for a castle, or perceive but even when better informed they seem to have no apprehension of the full force of the discrepancy. Take, for instance, Gustave Dorr's drawing of Don Quixote watching his armor in the inn-yard. Whether or not the venta de Quesera on the Seville Road is, as tradition maintains, the inn described in Don Quixote, beyond all question it was just such an inn-yard as the one behind Gustave Dor makes it an elaborate fountain such as no arriero ever watered his mules at in the coral of any venta in Spain, and thereby entirely misses the point aimed at by servants. It is the mean, prosic, commonplace character of all the surroundings and circumstances that gives a significance to Don Quixote's vigil and the ceremony that follows. Servants' humor is for the most part of that broader and simpler sort the strength of which lies in the perception of the incongruous. It is the incongruity of Sancho in all his ways, words, and works, with the ideas and aims of his master, quite as much as the wonderful vitality and truth to nature of the king, that unsmiling gravity of which servants was the first great master, servant to serious air, which sits naturally on swift alone, perhaps of later humorists, is essential to the nothing, unless indeed the coarse buffoonery of Phillips could be more out of place in an attempt to represent servants than a flippant, would-be facetious style, like that of mine. It is the grave matter-of-factness of the narrative, and the apparent unconsciousness of the author that he is saying anything ludicrous, anything but the merest commonplace, that give its peculiar f His, in fact, is the exact opposite of the humor of Stern and the self-conscious humorists. Even when Uncle Toby is at his best, you are always aware of the man stern behind him, watching you over his shoulder to see what effect he is producing. Servants always leaves you alone with Don Quixote and Sanco. He and Swift and the great humorists always keep themselves out of sight, or, more properly speaking, never think about themselves at all, unlike our latter-day school of humor. It is true that to do full justice to Spanish humor in any other language is well-nigh an impossibility. There is a natural gravity and a sonorous stateliness about Spanish, be it ever so colloquial, that make an absurdity doubly absurd, and give plausibility to the most preposterous. This is what makes Sancho Panza's drollery the despair of the conscientious translator. Sancho's curt comments can never fall flat, but they lose half their flavor when transferred from their native Castilian into any other medium. But if foreigners have failed to do justice to the humor of servants, they are no worse than his own countrymen. Indeed, were it not for the Spanish peasant's relish of Don Quixote, one might be tempted to think that the great humorist was not looked upon as a humorist at all in his own country. The craze of Don Quixote seems, in some instances, to have communicated itself to his critics, making them see things that are not in the book and run full tilt at phantoms that have no... Like a good many critics nowadays, they forget that screams are not criticism, and that it is only vulgar tastes that are influenced by strings of superlatives. Three pot But what strikes one as particularly strange is that while they deal in extravagant eulogies, and ascribe all manner of imaginary ideas and qualities to servants, they show no perception of the... To speak of Don Quixote as if it were merely a humorous book would be a manifest misdescription. Servants at times makes it a kind of commonplace book for occasional essays and criticisms, or for the observations and reflections and gathered wisdom of a long and stirring life. It is a mine of shrewd observation on mankind and human nature. Among modern novels there may be, here and there, more elaborate studies of character, but there is no book richer in individualized character. What Coleridge said of Shakespeare in Minimus is true of servants. 
he never, even for the most temporary purpose, puts forward a lay figure. There is life and individuality in all his characters, however little they may have to do, or however short a time they may be before the reader. Samson Carrasco, the curate, Teresa Panza, Altisidora, even the two students met on the road to the cave of Montesinos, all live and move and have their being. Even poor Maritornes, with her deplorable morals, has a kind heart of her own and some faint and distant resemblance to a Christian about her. And as for Sanco, though under it is this that makes it, as one of the most judicial-minded of modern critics calls it, the best novel in the world beyond all comparison. It is its varied humor, rank the author's preface idle reader, Thou mayest believe me without any oath that I would this book, as it is the child of my brain, were the fairest, gayest, and cleverest that could be imagined. But I could not counteract nature's law that everything shall beget its like. And what, then, could this story, ill-tilled wit of mine, beget but the story of a dry, shriveled? Sometimes when a father has an ugly, loutish son, the love he bears him so blindfolds his eyes that he does not see his defects, or, rather, takes them for gifts and charms. I, however, for though I pass for the father, I am but the stepfather to Don Quixote have no desire to go with the current of custom, or to implore thee, dearest reader, almost with tears in Thou art neither its kinsman nor its friend. Thy soul is thine own, and thy will as free as any man's. Whatever he be, thou art in thine own house, and master of it as much as the king of his. My wish would be simply to present it to thee plain and unadorned, without any embellishment of preface or uncountable muster of customary sonnets, epigrams, and eulogies, such as are commonly... For I can tell thee, though composing it cost me some labor, I found none greater than the making of this preface thou art now reading. Many times did I take up my pen to write it, and many did I lay it down again, not knowing what to write. One of these times, as I was pondering with the paper before me, a pen in my ear, my elbow on the desk, and my cheek in my hand, thinking of what I should say, there came it. For how could you expect me not to feel uneasy about what that ancient lawgiver they call the public will say when it sees me, after slumbering so many years in the silence of oblivion, coming out now, and then, when they quote the holy scriptures, any one would say they are saint. Thomases or other doctors of the church, observing as they do a decorum so ingenious that in one sentence they describe a distracted lover, and in the next deliver a devout little sermon that it is. Of all this there will be nothing in my book, for I have nothing to quote in the margin or to note at the end, and still less do I know what authors I follow in it, to place them at the beginning as all do. Also my book must do without sonnets at the beginning, at least sonnets whose authors are dukes, marquises, counts, bishops, ladies, or famous popes. Though if I were to ask two or three obliging friends, I know they would give me them, and such as the productions of those that have the highest reputation in our Spain could not equal. In short, my friend, I continued, I am determined that Senor Don Quixote shall remain buried in the archives of his own La Mancha, until heaven provides someone to garnish him with all those things. Hence the cogitation and abstraction you found me in and reason enough. What you have heard from me? Hearing this, my friend, giving himself a slap on the forehead, is it possible that things of so little moment and so easy to set right can occupy and perplex a ripe wit like yours, fit to break through and crush far greater obstacles? By my do you want to know it? As to 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 With regard to adding annotations at the end of the book, you may safely do it in this way. If you mention any giant in your book, contrive that it shall be the giant Goliath, and with this alone, which will cost you almost nothing, you have a grand note, for you can put the giant next, to prove yourself a man of erudition in polite literature. 
cosmography, manage that the river Tagus shall be named in your story, and there you are at once. If you should have anything to do with robbers, I will give you the story of Cacus, for I have it by heart. If with loose women, there is the Bishop of Mundanado, who will give if you should deal with love, with two ounces you may know of Tuscan you can go to Leon the Hebrew, who will supply you to your heart's content. Or if you should not care to go to foreign, in short, all you have to do is to manage to quote these names, or refer to these stories I have mentioned, and leave it to me to insert the annotations and quotations, and I swear by Now let us come to those references to authors which other books have, and you want for yours. The remedy for this is very simple. You have only to look out for some book that quotes them all, from a twos as you say yourself, and then insert the very same alphabet in your book. At any rate, if it answers no other purpose, this long catalogue of authors will serve to give a surprising look of authority to your book. Besides, no one will trouble himself to verify whether you have followed them, or whether you have not, being no way concerned in it, especially as, if I mistake not, this book of yours, Basil said a word, nor Cicero had any knowledge, nor do the niceties of truth nor the observations of astrology come within the range of its fanciful vagaries, nor have geometric. It has only to avail itself of truth to nature in its composition, and the more perfect the imitation, the better the work will be. And, as this piece of yours aims at nothing more than to destroy the authority and influence which books of chivalry have in the world and with the public, there is no need for you to go a-begging for aphorisms. Strive, too, that in reading your story the melancholy may be moved to laughter, and the merry made merrier still, that the simple shall not be wearied, that the judicious shall admire. Finally, keep you. I saw that this said, Faced a tea, this said, Faced this a vivid, this a vivid. I have no desire to magnify the service I render thee in making thee acquainted with so renowned and honored a knight, but I do desire thy thanks for the acquaintance thou wilt make with the famous, and so may God give thee health, and not forget me. Vale. Some commendatory verses are ganda the unknown to the book of Don Quixote of La Mancha, if to be welcomed by the good old book. Thou make thy steady aim, no empty chatter will dare to question or dis. But if perchance thou hast a mind to win of idiots approbation, lost labor will be thy reward, though they'll pretend appreciation. They say a goodly shade he finds who shelters neath a goodly tree, and such a one thy kindly star in bejar bath provided thee. A royal tree whose spreading bows a show of prince of a Manchigan gentleman thy purpose is to tell the story, relating how he lost his wits o'er idle tales of love and glory, of ladies, arms and cavaliers, a new or put no vain emblems on thy shield, all figures that is bragging play, a modest dedication make, and give no scoffer room to say what Alvaro de Luna here, or is it Hannibal again? Or does King Francis at Madrid once more of destiny complain? Ape not philosophy or wit, lest one who cannot comprehend make a wry face at thee and ask why offer flowers to me, my friend, be not a meddler. No affair, thy constant labor let it be to earn thyself an honest name, for fooleries preserved in print are perpetuity of shame. A further counsel bear in mind, if that thy roof be made of glass, it shows small wit to pick up stones to pelt the people as they pass. Win the attention of the wise, and give the thinker food for thought. Whoso indites frivolities, will but by simpletons be sought. A madness of gall to Don Quixote of La Mancha sonnet thou that didst imitate that life of mine when I in lonely sadness on the great rock Pinopober sat disconsolate in self-imposed penance so long as on the round of the fourth sphere the bright Apollo shall his courser steer, in thy renown thou shalt remain secure, thy country's name in story shall endure, and thy sage author Don Bellianus of Greece to Don Quixote of Lye Mancha sonnet in slashing, hewing, cleaving, word and deed, I was the foremost knight of chivalry stout. My mastery the fickle goddess owned, and even chance, 
submitting to control, grasped by the forelock, yielded to my will. Yet though above yon horned moon enthroned, my fortune seems to sit great quixote. Still envy of thy achievements fills my soul. The Lady of Oriana to Dulcinea del Toboso sonnet, O oh, fairest Dulcinea, could it be? It were a pleasant fancy to suppose so. Could Miraflores change to El Toboso, Gandolin, squire of Amadis of Gaul, to Sancho Panza, squire of Don Quixote, sonnet, all hail. Illustrious man, fortune when she bound the apprentice to no longer now doth proud knight errantry regard with scorn the sickle and the spade. Of towering arrogance less count is made than of plain esquire-like simplicity. I envy thee thy dapple and thy name, and those all forges thou wast wont to stuff with comforts that thy providence proclaim. Excellent Sancho, hail to thee again, to thee alone the Ovid of our Spain does homage with the rustic kiss and cuff. From El Donoso, the motley pote, on Sancho Panza. Orlando Furioso to Don Quixote of La Mancha Sonnet, if thou art not a peer, peer thou hast none. Among a thousand peers thou art a peer, nor is there room for one. I cannot be thy rival, for thy fame and prowess rise above all rivalry, albeit both bereft of wits we go. But, though the Scythian or the more to tame was not thy lot, still thou dost rival me. Love binds us in a fellowship of woe. The knight of Phoebus to Don Quixote of La Mancha, my sword, was not to be compared with thine Phoebus of Spain, marvel of courtesy, nor with thy famous arm this hand of mine that smote from I scorned all empire, and that monarchy the rosy east held out did I resign for one glance of Claridiana's eye, the bright aurora for whose love I pine. A miracle of constancy, my love, and banished by her ruthless cruelty. This arm had might the rage of hell to tame. But, Gothic Quixote, happier thou dost prove, for thou dost live in Dulcinea's name, and famous, honored, wise, she lives in thee. From Salisden to Don Quixote of La Mancha sonnet your fantasies. Sir Quixote, it is true, that crazy brain of yours have quite upset, but aught of base or mean hath never. Your deeds are open proof in all men's view. For you went forth in justice to abate, and for your pains sore drubbings did you get from many a rascally and ruffian crew. If the fair Dulcinea, your heart's queen, be unrelenting in her cruelty, if still you will be powerless to move her, in such hard case your comfort let it be that Sancho was a sorry go Dialogue between Babieca and Rocinant Sonnet B. How comes it, Rocinant, you were so lean, er? I'm underfed, with overwork I'm worn. B. With a overwork I am I am under er, your, your, I am. But what becomes of all the hay and corn? Er. My master gives me none. He's much too mean. B. Come. Come, you show ill breeding, sir, I ween. Tis like an ass your master thus to scorn. Arr. He is an ass, will die an ass. An ass was born. Why, he's in love. What's plainer to be seen? B, what, yeah, plainer. To be in love is folly. Arr. No great sense. B, you were metaphysical. Arr. From want of food. B. Rail at the squire, then. Er. Why, what's the good? I might indeed complain of. I grant it. Uh, it is my earnest hope that Your Excellency's good counsel in regard to my honorable purpose will not disdain the littleness of so humble a service. Miguel de Servants, Ezeroch P. 24, Chapter I, which treats of the character and pursuits of the famous gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, 7 P. 150, full size in a village of La Mancha, the name of which, an olive rather more beef than mutton, a salad on most nights, scraps on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, 
and a pigeon or so extra on Sundays, made away. The rest of it went in a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays, while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun. He had in his house a housekeeper past forty, a niece under twenty, and a lad for the field and marketplace, who used to saddle the hack as well as handle the bill-hook. The age of this gentleman of ours was bordering on fifty. He was of a hardy habit, spare, gaunt-featured, a very early riser and a great sportsman. They will have it his surname was Quixeta or Quesetta, for here there is some difference of opinion among the authors who write on the subject, although from reasonable conjectures it seems plain that he was called. This, however, is of but little importance to our tale. It will be enough not to stray a hair's breadth from the truth in the telling of it. You must know, then, that the above-named gentlemen, the seven whenever, but of all there were none he liked so well as those of the famous Felicino de Silva's composition, for their lucidity of style and complicated conceits were as pearls in his sight, particularly he was not at all easy about the wounds which Don Bellianus gave and took, because it seemed to him that, great as were the surgeons who had cured him, he must have had his face and body covered all over. He commended, however, the author's way of ending his book with the promise of that interminable adventure, and many a time was he tempted to take up his pen and finish it properly as is there proposed. Many an argument did he have with the curate of his village, a learned man, and a graduate of Siggins as to which had been the better knight, Palmerin of England, or Master Nicholas. The village barber, however, used to say that neither of them came up to the knight of Phoebus, and that if there was any that could compare with him it was Don Galloir, the brother. In short, he became so absorbed in his books that he spent his nights from sunset to sunrise, and his days from dawn to dark, poring over them and what with little sleep and much reading, his fancy grew full of what he used to read about in his books, enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, loves, and agonies, and he used to say the Sid Rodias was a very good knight, but that he was not to be compared with the knight of the burning sword who with one back stroke cut in half two fierce and monstrous gangs. He thought more of Bernardo del Carpio because at Roncesvalles he slew Roland in spite of enchantments, availing himself of the artifice of Hercules when he strangled Antaeus the son of Terra in He approved highly of the giant Morgant, because, although of the giant breed which is always arrogant and ill-conditioned, he alone was affable and well-bred. But above all he admired Reynaldos of Montalban, especially when he saw him sallying forth from his castle and robbing every one he met, and when beyond the seas he stole that image of Mahomet, to have a bout of kicking at that traitor of a gannelon he would have given his housekeeper and his niece into the bargain. In short, his wits being quite gone, he hit upon the strangest notion that ever madmen in this world hit upon, and that was that he fancied it was right and requisite, as well for the support Already the poor man saw himself crowned by the might of his arm emperor of Trebizond at least. And so, led away by the intense enjoyment he found in these pleasant fancies, he said the first thing he did was to clean up some armor that had belonged to his great-grandfather, and had been for ages lying forgotten in a corner eaten with rust and covered with mildew. He scored and polished it as best he could, but he perceived one great defect in it, that it had no closed helmet, nothing but a simple morion. This deficiency, however, his ingenuity supplied, for he contrived a kind of half-helmet of past aboard which, fitted on to the morion, looked like a whole one. It is true that in order to see if it was strong and fit to stand a cut, he drew his sword and gave it a couple of slashes, the first of which undid in an instant what had taken him a week to the ease with which he had knocked it to pieces disconcerted him somewhat, and to guard against that danger he set to work again, fixing bars of iron on the inside until he was satisfied with it. He next proceeded to inspect his hack, which with more quartos than a real and more blemishes than the steed of Gonola, that tantum pelis at os afoot, 
surpassed in his eyes the Bucephal. Four days were spent in thinking what name to give him, because, as he said to himself, it was not right that a horse belonging to a knight so famous, and one with such merits of his own, should